Hey everyone, welcome to Dog's Voice. Your dog is speaking to you. Are you listening? Dog's Please uh, turn off your uh, microphones and your video uh, as we go through the process here. Uh, Dog's Voice is offered twice a month. First with me uh, presenting a topic based on stress release and behavior modification in dogs and how important that is. And uh, one time with a speaker. Our next guest speaker will be Cindy Van Fleet, who is um, the owner of uh, Forever Homes for Dogs. And we'll be talking about fosters and shelters and how to transition these dogs who have um, a lot of issues. Um, so I'm um, going to put up the PowerPoint now. My name is Diane Garrett, and I'm honored to be here with you talking. If you would like to go to my Facebook page, Diane Garrett, uh, it is airing there live too. So uh, you can have, you can be in the Zoom room or you can view it there. Let's uh, go to the PowerPoint now. Um, what we'll be talking about today is well, um, just welcome to Dog's Voice again and 10 ways to use games to change behavior uh, using observation and analysis to go beyond stress release. That's something that I'm really passionate about and how dogs respond so positively when their environment is not a scary place to be. Uh, the dogs in the pictures here are rolling mats. Uh, in an arena where there are a lot of dogs and some of them are dog reactive. Um, there, is, uh, there are balls, there are cones to go around, but the dog is always focused on the owner. And then I like to set up uh, in, in class situations, uh, three baby pools. I like to set up one with colored balls. I like to set up one with water and water toys involved, and then one with sand with toys buried for digging. So that's just something uh, fun to do. So games get results. That's why I love it so much. Games teach and games are fun. They're fun for the pet parent and for the dog. Can games be used to affect behavior change? Absolutely. And how would that look? Well, we'll find out. Explore 10 ways, and you know that there are more than 10 ways. It's just that today we've got a limited amount of time. And so I'm going to present 10 behaviors and 10 ways to, to uh, help in the behavior modification process. And I'll have a few stories along the way as well. Uh, games can show and identify how an individual thinks or doesn't think. That's the identification process, the analysis process behind it. Um, and the reference, uh, you can find this in my book on page 179 to 183, chapter 13. And uh, these ideas are readily available for you there. So 10 behaviors, 10 ways, and the stories that tell about the teaching alternatives. And that's what it is, alternatives to many changes along the way. So you can use games to help human reactive, yes, biters or aggressive dogs, um, those who just respond without uh, thinking anymore because they've uh, been treated so badly or other types of reasons. Uh, secondly, fence chasing and over barking, that's a huge um, complaint from uh, clients. Dogs are stressed in a class structure. Um, everybody thinks that dogs should be comfortable and happy going to a class. Well, that's not always the case. Resource guarding and counter surfing, isolation and separation anxiety. I'm working with one client right now with isolation anxiety, a rescue. 
been in the home about two months and uh, we're using games to help him focus on something else other than his people leaving. Confidence building, show or performance dogs. Instead of just sticking them in their crate, you can play some games and get rid of a lot of stress of the environment. Uh, point to point. I call it point to point. Some people call it spider web and a lot of other names uh, for fearful dogs. Going from point to point to point when they're fearful to even walk one step. Um, and then to teach a dog how to um, play and to enjoy playing. And then relationship building because play builds relationships. So the human reactive or aggressive dogs, let's talk about that because that is the most challenging. Those are a lot of the dogs that I work with. I have quite a few biters right now. Um, and I don't ever have to use intimidation or confrontation or coercion or manipulation or uh, any other number of techniques to work with them and to uh, get results. So games can be used to make the human appear less worrisome if that is the problem, if you have a human reactive dog. Um, CC and DS, for those that aren't familiar with that term, uh, counter conditioning and desensitization, uh, still need to be paid attention to, as well as the three Ds. The three Ds are distance. You still have to incrementally work at a distance comfortable to the dog. The duration, work up to, uh, start with a short duration and work up to longer duration and distraction level, like one distraction, then two, how many distractions can a dog comfortably handle? Um, and I love foraging games for that purpose. Um, intelligence puzzles, when I say intelligence puzzles, I mean the type of puzzles that you see dogs working on uh, that might be like Nina Otteson puzzles. Uh, there are a lot of other brands as well, but they make the dog think and move pieces around and pull things out and slide drawers out. Uh, and they can be set up between the stranger and the and 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 the game um, at a distance so that the dog can see that they can be operant in the environment while their just their stimuli or trigger is there. A prerequisite, though, is that the dog must enjoy interacting with games and with their guardian, caretaker, foster, pet parent. So that's a prerequisite. And some of the dogs cannot get to the point where they can even play a game yet. And then pair something the dog likes uh, with something the dog is anxious about, and that's counter conditioning. So this dog is working on an intelligence toy and she's very fearful. And so we put an intelligence toy in the beginning uh, next to a fake dog uh, because she was very fearful of dogs and, and people. So a double whammy, but she wasn't aggressive. She was just afraid of everything in the environment. And you'll see that in a minute. So the first thing that you would do is introduce games. And they might not be able to work on them at first. So you just introduce them incrementally. Um, play games without a stranger nearby so that the trigger is not you know, holding up the learning of the game. And set up in many different environments, outdoors, indoors, bathroom, living room, in the car, many different environments. So they get used to seeing a game and, and their focus goes to that game. Add a stranger at the appropriate distance. If that's a football field away, away, then that's where it starts. And slowly decrease the distance, increase the duration and add another person. So it's just 
keep going uh, with the three Ds until you get to a point where the dog is just happy to see the person. Good, thing, good things happen when people are around. Now, this particular dog had a fear of life. Everything in the environment um, was, was horrible for her. It was hard to see her with her tail tucked all the time. Um, and this dog was even afraid of bunnies, wild, uh, wild bunnies in my yard. So here's the story. <laughs> so you can see here that she, we had a fake dog in the beginning and she was even too afraid to walk past this dog. We had um, lines that she could concentrate on where she was going. And we had her at first on a leash with encouragement to see if she could see that she could walk around this dog uh, in the environment. And then we extended it to no leash. So she had choice to move away or do whatever she wanted to. Uh, we wanted to see that she chose to be working with her pet parent here and walking past the dog. Uh, and so we kept the line so that she could have a clear pathway that was safe for her to walk through. And this is a unique photo because as you can see here, um, she's looking at the bunny and she's afraid of this bunny. And this bunny is wild bunny and I clicker trained the wild bunny. <laughs> so we were clicker training and the bunny is like, well, what's in it for me? <laughs> and she's out there. But what you're not going to see because I wasn't quick enough with the camera and the best stories that are told, you don't always have your camera ready. This bunny came up to this dog and sat on her haunches and put her feet on this dog's nose. And we were, our mouths dropped. This dog did absolutely nothing. In fact, was just in awe, just as in awe as we were about that particular uh, sequence of events. This dog is now not fearful. She knows how to maneuver in the environment. The environment is now pleasant to her. And all we did was make it fun. So here, um, little Charlie, my friend, Linda McCormick, that's her dog um, who has now passed away. But um, both of her dogs had uh, knew when the mailman was coming and everybody knows what I'm talking about. When they, that mailman comes, the barking starts and the fence chasing starts. So we set up an enrichment course to keep their mind busy. And so Charlie here was too busy exploring the course that we set up to worry that the mailman was even there. So with dogs who fence chase or bark outdoors at everything, why does this work? Because providing an environmental enrichment course makes the outcome take on new meaning and keeps their minds busy. And that's what we want to do because their minds are busy if they're barking at the mailman. That's how they get enrichment, basically, uh, unless we do some alternative work with them. So the first thing would be to reduce uh, the access to the fence with X-pens or an inner yard of X-pens where the dog goes first, like a play area, basically. Expansion of the area is what you're working toward that you can open up those gates further and further and further and fence chasing no longer becomes an issue. So setup includes identifying what the dog loves because if you're not doing what the dog loves or loves to eat or is curious about, then it's not so reinforcing, is it? <clears throat> In Charlie's case, he loved rocks. And so we would fill the toys <laughs> with rocks that he would have to find. And believe me, he knew exactly where those rocks were. And they were higher value than food. Um, so finding out what the dog loves is absolute key. Um, so ask yourself, is it food, toys, tennis balls? What is it? You could set up cups all over the yard, pre-set up the night before or whatever with food underneath um, throughout the enrichment area. And then release the dog at the time when the mailman is about to come uh, so that they can do some desensitization and counter condition work to that distraction. Um, these distractions 
also could be a person walking by or a person and a dog walking by. Um, you could set up a fake dog across the street for them to see uh, just to start the process rolling. Uh, trucks going by, it could be any number of things. Remember, each dog is an individual and nothing is set in stone and there are no recipes. You have got to know the dog. So add in some intelligence games. You can even make them. So in the photo here, there's a little dachshund, if you can see way back there. She's exploring a sprinkle that I set out. Um, and my Valor is exploring a box of balls over there. And the cones are set up uh, before the fence and the, the yard has been widened. So there's no barking at the fences. You could do a bowl exercise and you can slowly use your creative imagination to expand the enrichment even further. Um, changing the habit of the dog in the yard is the goal. So what do you want the dog to do instead is what you want to ask. And this could be teaching only to alert bark, uh, using maybe uh, the, the thing that I use, of course, is my three bark rule. So if they see something, they can bark three times, four times, whatever. And uh, then, then I'll take care of it. After that, I, I don't need to have any more barking going on. Um, I want quiet looking at the fence, uh, no fence chasing, no lunging, barking, chasing. Uh, that just builds up adrenaline and makes it harder for them to come down. And a lot of times I see a dog that is hyper alert, overexcited, hyper arousal. Um, with uh, games in the yard, other things to do. Now there are other things to do besides uh, behavior that um, humans don't like. Now let's take a look at dog stress in a class environment. Mallor is one who does get very stressed in those situations. Uh, he's got a lot to look at. He, he is very focused though on the games, as you can see piled up there. I have all kinds of things ready to go. And on the floor there, I have a bottle of water and a bowl and I have his tug toy. There are hula hoops and a tunnel and all kinds of things that we can do um, to keep his focus on something else, keep him calmer, keep him uh, stress-free. So we want to make the class fun. And so that other dogs and people in the environment are no longer a trigger, that he can actually relax and, and have fun in that environment. Um, so games allow uh, the dog to do that and focus on something else, just like the mailman uh, in the previous slide. You can take your little uh, environmental changes with you along the way and really make life fun for your dog. Um, a, stressful, a stressful situation then becomes something to look forward to. I also like um, the concept of backpack walks and taking a backpack with you on your walk and pulling over and taking out the stuff in the backpack so the dog can explore. That especially works really well with dogs who are reactive or sound sensitive or very, very shy. You need to give your dog a social pressure break. The social pressures that humans put on animals, you have to look at it from their perspective, not your perspective and what you think they should be doing. A dog can, some dogs can take a lot of social pressure and love it. Other dogs can't take very much. Some dogs can take moderate pressure or they can work up to it because they've never been exposed to a lot of social pressure. Games can help. You can take out a game at, at uh, a class and just allow them to work on it behind a barrier. A lot of times in my classes, I have the dogs, I have barriers set up with uh, like a blanket around it, a curtain or whatever that can be drawn and the dog can be in a safe zone and have social pressure released while they're working on a game. 
Um, it's great for reactive dog classes and confidence building classes um, because the dogs then begin to realize that they can be in the presence of other dogs, people, noises, other stimuli uh, without anything to worry about and it is actually fun for them. So here are some more classroom situations. It takes away worry. Uh, this is Duncan. He used to be very worried in the classroom. He couldn't even walk on the floors. He would lie on his bed over there, as you, you see over there. He wouldn't even come off it. But now when the games were added, he got furious and he was satisfying his mind. And it took the focus off the scary environment completely. This dog had bitten eight times before I was called in and he never bit again. Um, and we called him Mr. PR later because he liked everything. He just, he just had to be taught that things were not scary and he didn't have such a great life before. And this dog is fearful. You can see by her body language, she was hurt pretty bad. She's from Texas. She was kicked around and, and hurt. And so she got depressed and uh, fearful dogs can learn what else to do in the environment and not be so scared um, to venture out. You can see that she is trying, she's exploring, uh, she is focused on what's in that box. It, it's building dopamine. She's uh, like unwrapping a Christmas present and, and she's learning to enjoy all kinds of different games, homemade or bought. And she stopped being depressed. She started being more confident. So even a simple nose work game can be enough to take the dog's mind off a scary environment. And I love using games like this. So dogs who guard resources and those who counter surf. Games are great for that too. Um, and this dog uh, did resource guard um, and providing multiple games as feeding receptacles in a safe area that they can actually enjoy uh, eating. They can take the focus away from guarding the bowl or having other dogs around that they're guarding from, and they can actually focus on what they're doing instead of focusing on the other dog or the human. So teaching an off cue by using a foraging toy. So all I have to say is um, off or nothing. I can just offer a toy and put it down and then I can name off if I would like to. So that off means fun things are starting and I don't have to counter surf to get reinforcement. I get reinforcement anyway. So there's no reason to counter surf. So if we take the reason away, for doing some of the behaviors, uh, the, the behavior changes. And so we make a new habit that they don't have to counter serve or resource guard. And of course, there's much more to it if you have an extreme resource guarder like I did uh, with my little sky, but that's a discussion for another time. Off becomes fun. Always making everything fun. So let's take a look at the two games on the next slide. So these are some, uh, I hope you don't mind, I'm gonna take a little water. Some football desensitization. I made some tweaks to Ro John Rogerson's technique here. Um, you split the dog's meal into four bowls, a quite wide, a wide range, wide apart. Um, and you place the four bowls. Uh, you can also use feeders. That's my rendition is to, instead of using bowls, maybe one would be a treat bowl or a, a slow feeder or different kind of uh, <clears throat> serving of food method um, and put them on the floor in a large circle in a quiet room. And then uh, have some food nearby that the dog absolutely loves. And bring the dog into the room. And at first on leash, uh, just in cases, you know, you'd have a guarding incident occurring 
But if you're doing this exercise, you better have gone through some other steps first before you start playing this game. So basically it's a food game <clears throat> where you go to the bowl that the dog is not eating out of and you pick up that bowl while they're eating in another bowl um, and you add some meat to it and you put it down. And then you go to another bowl and that the dog is not eating from and you repeat that process. And then you remove the social pressure of your body. So you want the dog to notice you doing this and adding something and becoming curious as to what you're doing. And there are many more resources. He doesn't have to protect his resource and he's not being confronted. Um, so you might, when he, when he starts to get curious and he starts uh, looking at you, you might ask for a sit or a down, or if he's standing nicely, you can uh, replace the bowl and then move away. This is especially good if uh, your dog has worries about you as the person or has been confronted in the past uh, with the bowl feeding. Um, so you just continue that and have fun with it until the food is gone and you're just changing the way that the dog sees your presence whenever you're around, good things happen. Um, and those, there's no social pressure to act one way or another. So you do this uh, once a day for two weeks. And then if you want to feed from that point on with two bowls or a bowl and a treat bowl, um, I like to sometimes um, give my dogs a bowl to eat from and then a game maybe for the other half of the meal or a treat bowl. Or since they're raw fed, treat bowls are not always the best thing unless I have some freeze dried or air dried um, pieces. So there's no reason not to use two types of feeding elements and the dog will feel less protective because there's more than one bowl. But more importantly, is that they're not being confronted. You might also add if your dog gulps and a lot of resources, a dog who guard resources gulp their meal. You might wanna add a large stone or rock or a tennis ball if you don't have a slow feeder around so that the dog has to really take his time to enjoy the meal. Um, you're just making mealtime fun. And uh, then after a while, you just sit down at a distance. Again, distance has to be what the dog is comfortable with. Maybe read a book, don't pay attention to the dog. And then from time to time, just toss a, a special treat um, into the bowl or into a bowl, another bowl that's maybe near you or uh, one that you can hit the bowl with when you toss. I'm not good at that. <laughs> I don't know if you guys are good at tossing things into bowls. Um, but that's basically all it's about is you're just getting, you're making musical bowls, I like to call it. That's what you're doing. You're having fun um, and the dog is having fun eating. Uh, a toy game for dogs who guard resources. I had one and I'll show you the link if we can get to it uh, with Valor that I posted on my wall this morning. Um, just to show and demo what that would look like. Just put a large blanket out on the floor and then have about 10 or 15 toys on the blanket a good distance apart. And then you wait for the dog to settle down and start to play with the toy or chew. So just wait for it. They shouldn't be looking at you. They should be grabbing a toy or something. And when they do that, then you stand across from uh, the dog so that they can see you do this, but quite you know a distance away. And you don't have to start by picking up the toy. You can just start by placing a treat on top of a toy and then walking away and maybe doing that a second time. And then, and then the third time, maybe then pick up a toy and place, pick it up and put it down and put a treat on top of it. Um, and then and put it back on the blanket. And you want the dog to see you doing this because picking up that toy equals fun things are happening. And resource guarding is less likely to occur because you're not confronting the dog, you're giving something alternative. 
for him to do. So as the dog goes to eat the treat on the toy, you go to the next one, you walk away and repeat. You know, always make sure the dog sees you picking up the toy. Uh, again, it's a form of counter conditioning or pairing something good with something that might entice them to guard that resource. So let's see if we can look at the video that I did if you haven't seen it yet. So we just set up, we just wanted to have fun. I asked Valor if he wanted to have some fun. <laughs> and he sat down, he, without me asking. And we then you walk away, no social pressure. You walk behind them. And I put another treat on the red toy there. You can see it, it's, it's the color of the brown there. And then I just wait for Valor to turn around and find it. And I walk away again so he can be comfortable eating it. And then the third time I pick up the hamburger there and I pick it up and I put it down. And my motions are very slow and I'm watching what he's doing and how he's doing it watching his body language. He takes a toy and then I do the next one and so on all around. And now he's gonna check other toys because he's like having fun with this and maybe there's food on some other toy. Now, now this is always fun where I have to get back to the PowerPoint. <laughs> so it, if you have any questions about that, that's really a, a fun way to work with a dog who guards resource, resources. Um, the next uh, behavior is separation and isolation anxiety. Here's one I jacked before we started um, working on his separation anxiety, which was quite elevated. This jack was found on the side of a road with his eye hanging out and in a thunderstorm. And so he had a lot of free fears just from that. So you're gonna see that he, he can't even be out of sight of his people for seconds. Basically, this is just the going in and out of the door and just being nonchalant about it. But no games are set up, nothing set up yet. Oh, you can jump high. <laughs> so he just comes back nonchalantly so that the, that behavior is not reinforced. Um, and then when we started setting out, um, we started setting out things for him to do, activities, um, and setting them up in different environments. Because at first he couldn't eat because his digestive system shut down. He was so stressed. Um, and then we did have to add medication to his distress, which helped quite a bit. And then he got a lot calmer and he was able to lie down and wait for them to come home and even go to sleep. So, so games can really help uh, setting up an activity course indoors like we did outdoors. Games are helpful. Uh, you do it slowly and incrementally for success, always keeping your mind on duration with these cases. What can the dog handle without you know, whining and jumping and worrying about where the person is and proofing along the way as well to see where you're at. But duration is always the key with these types of cases because some dogs are just too anxious to even do a game in the beginning. So you have to start seconds in, in and walk away and come back and sit and stand up and 
Uh, it's just a whole process, maybe even before you add the games. But it, when you add the games, it gives them something else to do, something else to focus on. So keys to success with the games, that you first play games without leaving the room. Your dog should love playing games with you. You don't have to leave. The, the game should not mean that you're leaving. Um, and then you might just um, get up if you see the dog is really involved and walk to another room and back and so on. It's just a real slow process. Um, then set up some activities, uh, many, several, maybe even up to five or six or 10 and leave for a very short time, seconds, depends on where you're at, minute. When you come back, pick everything up. Leaving starts to equal good things are happening. And the goal is that the dog is happy to see their pet parent leave. <laughs> um, dogs are always happy when we come back, of course, but they should be happy when we leave as well, because that means fun is occurring. So having something to do changes habits. We are really just changing habits. And variety is key so that they're not doing the same thing over and over again, that you provide different activities every time you leave. And then games can be used for confidence building and fearful dogs. I, my favorite, really, um, breaking it down into really tiny little baby steps, easy to do things that sets each dog up for success. So here, um, this dog was very, very shy. He couldn't play. Uh, he never really wanted to play. Who knows what happened? And instead of hiding treats under the cup, um, I put them in the cup, like a food bowl. And I was down on his level. And I just presented it. And here he's kind of having to think like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> and then once we got past that, then I would lie on my stomach and I would just turn the cup over and put the treats on top of it. So this sounds very simple to us, but this can be like climbing a mountain to a dog. So we start with the easiest of easy things to do, puzzles, homemade games like a muffin tin filled with balls, but you don't fill the whole muffin tin with balls, maybe just one ball and the rest have treats and then you go from that. Um, <clears throat> or other things filled with treats, other games. Uh, what you wanna do is just try to improve this dog's confidence incrementally. And that is the key for a fearful dog, is they're just surviving right now. Always, always surviving. We want them to thrive. We want them to make good decisions. We want them to be confident um, and, and be able to move around in um, environments without running away from those environments. So some dogs, remember, again, are not able to do puzzles at first or even foraging. So if they can't do it, that just means they can't do it. It doesn't mean they won't do it later. And it doesn't mean that you can't move forward with it. And then what I see a lot of people doing is, oh, he can't do that. Well, not right now, but maybe later as you work on it incrementally step by step. So you break it down, tiny little pieces to accomplish successful incremental tasks. And that's what builds a dog's confidence. Um, and then, then you can go to the intermediate level and then to more advanced levels um, because they'll feel comfortable with it. And then we have the show performance dog environments, which are very challenging for a lot of dogs. And a lot of times they're just taken into these environments without preconditioning. And I, I like to precondition my dogs to this. And um, turves can be very flighty in show situations, how they're wired. So this is my Valor and I at a Rally O freestyle show. We're bring, we brought a lot of toys, as you saw before. And here we go out onto the floor 
and we're playing uh, some mentally stimulating games and it keeps his mind off the venue and it helps release stress. You can see uh, some activity going on in the, for the background there. Um, it's a great relaxer for show dogs. Uh, Pre-show and post-show de-stressor if a dog is worried about the other dogs or crowd or noises, the games really help um, as visuals uh, and something different to do. So it can make showing fun. And then there's point-to-point -point training for fearful dogs. So this little guy is very fearful. Um, he has since passed away. He was in downtown um, business and maybe was exposed to the business a little too soon. So he was really shy about people coming in, <clears throat> walking out the door into the street because there were trucks and sounds. And so when I say point to point, I mean <clears throat> that he, the, we set a point which is the doorway usually. And then we set a point B and then a point C and see if the dog can go from those points. And in each of those points, we set up a game. Because shy dogs have trouble coping with new additions to an environment. We want to have something familiar in the environment that they love, but we don't want it to <clears throat> take away from their love of that item. Uh, we just want them to build confidence and, and help with coping skills. So duration is really important here. And uh, them having a safety zone that they can go back to. This is um, um, a really nice tea touch technique that I learned from Kathy Cascade, which I love, <clears throat> is where you take the leash um, the pet parent hands you the leash and uh, the dog is encouraged to go with you only as far as they want to. And they can always go back to the pet parent, but the pet parent is passive. And then uh, the person with the leash asks them again, you can give them a reward or praise them. And, and each time they go a little bit further and a little bit further with the person, but each time they can always go back to the safety zone. <clears throat> So this dog's safety zone was the doorway of the shop and he could go back there anytime he wanted to. Uh, Stormy is very shy, fearful walking outdoors. All the people, dogs, objects, sounds truly scary to him. And so we did games going from point A to point B to help him become more confident. Um, we set up pre-desensitized mat that means like a, a little mat that you bring along with you um, that already meant to relax, that he had relaxed on, that he had played games on previously before even walking out the door. So a game or two to look forward to, you have to always preset it before he walks out the door. And then walk slowly to the point and incrementally increase the distance. The mat and toy are from the point, so you're setting a new point, point A to B, then stop. And then maybe we do another point A to B until the dog is very comfortable and starts looking curious and forward to that game. And then we set a point B and so on. <clears throat> so it works with dogs stressed with real life, neighborhood sounds, the little dog that can't even walk out the door because he's so afraid. Um, and we measure, each point should be measured out specifically. And the dog now has a purpose other than fearing the environment or reacting to it, he can have fun in it. I'm trying to make the environment fun for a fearful dog, and it does take time. Um, and then toy is alternative to reacting to the environment to teach a dog how to play and to enjoy playing. Um, again, you always have to realize that not all dogs know how to play. In fact, 80% of the dogs that I work with are probably, they probably have behavior issues because they've never learned to play and enjoy life. They always have pressures, a lot of social pressure on them, um, forced on them by the humans that they live with. Um, the dog may become afraid to play. And so um, then we have to teach them to play. At first, the dog might not play at all, but 
with time and variety, toy play becomes something to look forward to. And putting treats on toys makes the toy itself fun because it's a visual. Dogs are looking at it. Oh, that has it. So they'll go and search it and then pretty soon they'll pick it up in their mouth and pretty soon they're tossing the toy around. And I love play because it is a laboratory for real life learning. And all dogs, like all children, need to learn play. For problem solving, I like relationship building exercises, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, like playing catch. Had a German Shepherd, a dog reactive. We played catch. Every time a dog appeared, we played catch. That was her favorite game. And so dogs became a non issue. We played catch. <laughs> that meant we were playing catch. We didn't use any treats, we were just playing catch. We had cup games, um, which can you can have prey distraction games going on. You can help build relationships that have eroded because usually when a dog is reactive or has a behavioral problem, the relationship erodes because that's not the dog that the person signed up for. So we wanna have a pro progressive behavior modification program and that can include games. So relationship building, when I talk about that, that means games that you do together with your dog. You are interactively involved because you are creating a bond and a better relationship. And one scientist said that when, when people see what their dogs can do, they have a better bond to them. And so... That's really important if you're coaching and working with a person. So let's take um, a look at a couple of problem solving games. This is a basket challenge. And this dog was from the Korean meat market, saved, and didn't speak English. So you'll see him look at me kind of weird <laughs> because he doesn't know the language. Okay, you can find it. Go, find it. So he knew go. Good job. And he does okay. what I like to see, studying the problem like you would study a math problem or whatever. Like how to do it. Okay. I'm encouraging him a little bit more than I'd like to because of his situation. And he walks away because he's thinking. And say, how can I do that? Okay. Yes, good boy. <laughs> so let your dogs think. Good job, yes. And that's what I love um, very, very much about games is because we don't let our dogs think. We're always bossing them around, asking them to do things, hovering over them. Just let them think. When they walk away from a thinking exercise, they are thinking, how am I going to do this? They don't need any feedback from you. I gave a little more feedback in that because of his situation, but I would reduce that quite a bit. Then we have color recognition, and this is Zoe. She had bitten a couple people. She was on a shock collar earlier, and that went wrong. So we find yellow. There's the thing. She is a thinker. Find yellow. Good. Good. So I didn't have any treats under that. I just wanted her to find the color that we worked so hard to commit to memory. And we added then two eggs and then the three that you saw there. And I've had some dogs go up to six or seven different colors and choose no matter where the yellow was, they chose the yellow. Um, so that's a thinking game. And that takes interaction between you and the dog. And they learn how to make good decisions by thinking it through. And we have size recognition. 
So dogs are very in tune to the different sizes right. and shapes of things in their environment. Um, objects, okay, fine. things that look like dogs or people staring at them. Good boy. Good yeah. mind. And so even though he didn't go to the right one first, the praise came for doing the right one. He Got went it. right immediately yeah. to the smaller size. And then used his paw to tip it over and get the reward. Excellent. So again, um, there's no confrontation. I'm not making him do anything. I'm just teaching. And you're teaching the dog an alternative thing to do in light of a scary trigger or stimuli in the environment. There are other games like the clue game. I did have one and I couldn't find it for the life of me, but you set up two tables and you put a cup, um, like a teacup or something on the table and turn it upside down. And the tennis ball is the clue to where the treat would be. So then you put the treat under the tennis ball and you let the dog see you doing that. And then you put up a curtain and then you switch where the tennis ball is to the other side and put the treat over there and then take the curtain down and see if the dog knows the clue of where the treat would be. It's really fun to do. Um, and then name your toys game. Everybody's done this. Where's your monkey? Where's your elephant? You know, and you name them one by one. And we all have heard about that dog that could correctly bring the right toy, and there were thousands of them in a pile. You could do cup shuffling, like the shell game. That's a lot of fun. Or find it games. And I'm going to show you an Easter egg hunt find it game um, with a shy dog in the mix, uh, and then my two dogs. He'd never done an egg hunt before. Golden Retriever. And they love this. And the golden retriever is learning from the other dog. So that's fun. It's fun to watch and it's fun to do. And they do this type of thing a lot, maybe not with Easter eggs, but with other containers that you're hiding around. This is something you can do if the mailman is coming around or there is some stimuli in the environment that you want to provide an alternative behavior. So let's talk about the science of all of this. Problem solving and behavior modification has been studied in people not very many studies with dogs, um, but selectively, this study selectively reviewed problem solving theory and research for possible application and behavior modification. Problem solving was defined as a behavioral process, which makes available a variety of response alternatives. Again, that word, alternatives, or giving them alternatives for dealing with a problematic situation. It increases the probability of selecting the most effective response from among these alternatives. So I'd rather be doing that than this because this is more rewarding, more reinforcing. 
there are five stages of problem solving identified, and that was general orientation or setting up, you know, setting it all up. Um, the problem definition and formulation, which you're thinking of ahead of time. What is the situation? What is the behavior I want to change? And how can I provide an alternative? And then you have the generation of the various alternatives that you want to provide. And then there's the decision making by the, the animal participating and verification that this is reinforcing to them and that it is more reinforcing than doing the other behavior we're trying to get rid of. So training and problem solving was conceptualized as a form of self-control training. And if you think about it, that's what we're doing. We're helping the dog make better decisions. We're helping them to consciously have more self-control rather than just responding to a stimuli or trigger. The individual is learning how to solve problems, not create problems. And so therefore discovers for themselves the most effective way of responding because they're getting rewarded for it. And the general guidelines are presented for clinical application with cases characterized by a deficit in effective behavior and its emotional consequences. The second study was game-based learning and problem-solving method with um, children. And we all know that sometimes applications with children definitely can apply to what we're doing with uh, the canids. Uh, and this study compared the effects of game-based learning and textbooks on students' achievement. So the problem-solving method was employed in learning process in the classroom. So 113 students of grade eight from three junior high schools in the province of Yogyakarta were selected using convenience sampling and participating in this study. Now they had quite a big sample. <clears throat> the data indicates that the students were, who were exposed to game-based learning within problem-solving approach significantly outperformed their counterparts who were exposed only um, on the basis of textbook uh, learning. Um, so when we apply that to our dogs, um, you will definitely see the dogs that play, the dogs that problem solve are significantly outperforming uh, dogs who have been raised differently. The data from questionnaire revealed that the students preferred game-based learning and they could say so, the dog says so by participation and because they could understand the materials with enjoyable with enjoyment, I would say, and ease. So, uh, so now I will uh, stop sharing this. And any questions that you have, let's talk about them. Um, let's see if we have any questions. If you want to uh, take your mic off, you can. If you would like to ask a, a question, I don't see any questions in the meeting chat. But please go ahead, uh, give you a few minutes to think about it and formulate something. Um, but you can see the importance of how uh, games can help um, a dog learn. They are sentient beings. They do have a voice. They do um, like to participate in other things. And if they, they're not participating in something that's acceptable, they will participate in something that's um, not, not acceptable to our human standards, but more acceptable to what they like to do and reinforcing to them, like barking and fence chasing and <clears throat> fighting to keep the person away because they have a bad association with them. So if there aren't any questions and you have questions later, please don't hesitate to um, contact me. I'll post your questions in group or uh, uh, in, um, in the um, recorded chat um, areas that I'll be posting uh, after this recording. 
So I want to thank you all for participating and, and being here. Uh, it's exactly 5 o'clock p.m. And so um, since there are no questions, I must have either done a good job or you're still thinking about them. So I will see you all later and play games with your dogs. Bye-bye.